morning. How are we this morning? Good deal. You ready to hear something from Jesus this morning? Are you sure? Did you come to church to hear something from Jesus this morning? Did you? Are you sure? Are you positive? How many of you just showed up because you needed somewhere to go before lunch? Oh, man, don't do that. See, a, a lot of what we get out of church every week, if you come every week or if you come once a month or if you come... Once a year, um, whatever it may be. A lot of what we get out of church depends on what we are stepping into church with. So if you worshipped together corporately as we were doing uh, music and worship this morning, if you worshipped on your way to church, it made worship a whole lot better this morning, right? Y'all with me this morning? Y'all been on vacation? Anybody already take a nap this morning? Did you just wake up? Listen, first service was energetic and excited. No, they weren't. But it's good. It's all right. School starts back tomorrow. Life as we know it. Yes, some of y'all are going, what? That was, most of us with kids are like, so? Or, or, yeah, but um, those of you with small kids are like, yes, amen. Anyway, all right, you got it. So anyway, I did all that junk just to kind of get my nerves out because I'm extremely nervous. I don't know what the deal is this morning. I feel, like that, uh, I feel like God has something for me to share with you this morning. I do that every week, but I don't know. I'm just kind of nervous this morning. I want to make sure I don't mess it up. Worship good. I want you to hear from Jesus this morning. This series that we're working on is entitled Questions from Jesus. There are many people who will estimate that Jesus asked over 100 questions. Some say 165. Some say 180. Some, some people say over 300 questions that Jesus asked. And we're not doing a 300-week sermon series. So we just picked out a few of them. Um, and they've been good. We've got a great teaching team here at Living Water. Kyle last week asked the question when Jesus with Peter and the disciples said, do you love me? Um, last week was our Say Yes Sunday where we asked people to sign up and be a part of serving in the church. And part of that was <clears throat> off of that message that Kyle preached where Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? And if you love me, feed my sheep. Take care of the people that I've left for you. Take care and serve. So, great message last week. And then this morning, I'm going to continue the series with um, another story. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be in John chapter 5. Excuse me one second. Mm. Agua. That was good. I needed that. <clears throat> Listen, I'm going to be in John chapter 5 this morning, and I'm going to be asking a, a really interesting question. To me, it's very interesting, and it seems almost, um, I don't know, weird. Uh, and, and you'll find out here in a minute as we dig through this. If you follow me on social media, you'll see I put the question out there yesterday of what we're going to do today. Um, also, one quick thing. Um, yesterday afternoon in the storm uh, that hit, it blew out our modem, which blew out our internet here in the building. So if you're trying to get online this morning, you're trying to get on the website, and you're not using your cell service, you ain't going to get it, all right? We don't have any internet around the building this morning, and that's all right. It, it's okay. It's all right. If you're watching online, I don't know how, because we're not able to stream this morning. Um, but just so you know that, okay? Let me dig into this. Questions from Jesus. Here's the one that I'm going to ask this morning. I'm going to ask the one that Jesus asked um, straight out of the book of John, chapter 5. He asked this question, do you want to get well? That, that seems like an odd question. Do you want to get well? Now, if there's anybody in the room this morning and you're sick or you don't feel good or you're hurting or, or you know, you got a limp or there's some kind of pain going on, if I said to you, do you want to get well, what would your answer be? Yeah, yeah it seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? Or does it? See, I, for me, I, I've had, I, I'll be 55 years old in September. That means that I wake up every morning with pain. Anybody with me? How many of you know you're alive in the morning when there's some sort of pain? How many of you woke up with a pain this morning you hadn't experienced before? You don't know where it came from, and then you remember playing sports somewhere and went, oh, that was it, all right? It just comes around, right? Anybody with me? Pains every morning? It's just me, all right? Every morning. I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about me in pain, all right? Every single morning. Not, just a few months ago, it's actually been a, a while ago, um, I got out of bed one morning, and I really thought that Missy was sabotaging me. Because when I stepped out of bed in the morning and I put my left foot on the floor, it felt like I stepped on a broken bottle. It felt like there was broken glass all over our bedroom floor. 
I could barely limp to get to the bathroom, which is much needed for me in the morning. I could barely limp to get there, but I got there. I got it stretched out throughout the day. It kind of eased up. And then I was like, oh, okay, great. Laid back down the next night, got up the next morning, stepped on the broken. It felt like it. That's just, it was horrible. What I found out is that I had something called plantar fasciitis. Anybody ever had that or know what it is? All right, it's bad. It just doesn't feel good. I'm not going to die or nothing, but it just didn't feel good. It was not very good. So once I realized I had plantar fasciitis, I did what we're supposed to do. Because what we're supposed to do is call our doctors, right? Aren't we? That's what we're supposed to do. But I did what I'm supposed to do. I got on WebMD, is what I did. I got on Google, and I typed in the Google. I typed in, my foot hurts and feels like I'm stepping on glass. What do I do? And the Google said, you got plantar fasciitis. And I went, oh, okay, what do I do? Do you know what I proceeded to do from what Google told me? I spent about $600 on different pairs of tennis shoes trying to relieve plantar fasciitis. I got inserts. I got boots. I got straps. I was contrapted in traction at night, holding my foot up with a boot that was ripping the sheets off the bottom of the bed. I was doing everything for months and months and months and months of just this goofy foot pain and everything that was in it. Wear these kind of shoes. Wear these kind of shoes. No, not those kind of shoes. Get your foot to go this way. Get your I was doing everything. Then I did the smart move. You know what I did? I went to my doctor. <laughs> that was kind of stupid, wasn't it, to wait that long? I went like six months trying to figure this out. The doctor said, well, I'm going to send you to a, uh, to a foot doctor, to a podiatrist. I'm going to send you to a podiatrist. Now, by this point, I'd been doing the Google, all right? I'd been Googling the heck out of plantar fasciitis. And what I realized is if you can get to a podiatrist, they can give you a cortisone shot in your foot. Mm, yeah, gel going in your heel. Yeah. But at this point, I was so tired of the pain that I went to the podiatrist and I sat down and I said, hey, my name's Tony. You got any shots I can have, man? I mean, he, I, I wasn't like tweaking like, I need a shot, man. Come on. I, I was just sitting there. I need a shot. So after a few minutes and he goes, yes, you have plantar fasciitis. And yeah, we can do a cortisone shot. And uh, I was like, do it, man. Stuck my foot out. He put that needle about that. It wasn't that big. It was about that big. He put that needle in my foot and shot that cortisone up in there. And I'm telling you, instantaneously, I didn't feel any pain. That afternoon, I went back to my ballet classes and I started right. That's a horrible image, me in tights, isn't it? All right. I did not. I've never done ballet. But um, I, I, I felt great. I felt great for about two weeks. And then the pain started coming back. Pain started coming back again. So then I got on the Google again. And I typed in... How many cortisone shots can you get in your foot? So I went back and saw the podiatrist, and he said, yeah, I can give you another cortisone shot. Maybe it'll last a little longer this time. Foot, foot, bam, cortisone shot. I get another one. This one lasts about 40 days. I am so excited. But after about 40 days, stepped on glass first thing in the morning is what it felt like. Bam, here's it goes again. I get on the Google, and I go, how many more shots can I get of cortisone? Went back to see him, sat with him, and he said, hey, um, I can give you one more shot. After this one, it's going to be over a year before I can do it again because it'll begin to deteriorate the tissue in the heel of your foot. I'm like, well, Google told me I could just go to a different podiatrist and he could give me shots. He said, you know what you need to do? You need to go see a physical therapist. I was like, I don't want to do that. They hurt. They, they're going to make you do stuff you don't want to do. Went to the physical therapist, had a great physical therapist, great guy, sat down with him. He did something awkward. When I got in there, he began to work on my foot and had my shoe off, and he was working with my ankles and my foot and all the different stuff. And then after, he, he kept doing things like this. Huh. Hmm. Oh. And every time he'd bend something in a way, it would go click, clock, click, click. And it was just like crunching like Rice Krispie treats all over their place. And then the oddest thing, he looks up at me sitting on the floor, kind of holding my foot, and he goes, you want to get this better? What kind of question is, do you want to get this better? <laughs> nope, I'm good. I like the pain. It's pretty cool. Got any shots? <laughs> um, I said, yeah. He didn't tell me what to do. He didn't tell me how he was going to do it, other than he said, come back Tuesday. And they begin to work. And they begin to work and they begin to work. And I saw a physical therapist and I got to tell you, what they discovered was I had plantar fasciitis, but it was caused by the fact that I had tendonitis on the inside and the outside of my ankle. And as soon as they were able to clear up the tendonitis on the inside and outside of my ankle with a lot of exercises and a lot of really, really difficult work with my ankle, the plantar fasciitis went away. But the audacity of that guy to ask me, do I want to get better?
this story that we're going to deal with today. It's a story of a man who um, the Bible calls him an invalid. That means that he wasn't able to walk. Um, he wasn't able to take care of himself. One commentator that I read about this story, who was a gentleman who had been in a wheelchair his entire life, kind of looked back at what first century, what it meant to be an invalid. And not only could you not get anywhere, you had to depend on people. You couldn't take care of yourself with basic hygiene. You can just imagine the life that this guy had lived. And the story goes like this. As a matter of fact, if you got a Bible, go to John chapter 5, and I'm going to read it to you. I, I want to teach you a little bit about the Bible and some things you can learn about why we trust our Bibles and why we believe that they're God's Word. And then I, I want to just dig into this idea of this question Jesus asked, do you want to get well? So in John chapter 5, verse 1, you can pick up with me. It'll be up on the screen. Um, if you can get online on your cell service, you can get on there and go to our website. Like I said, the internet's just not, it's not doing today, all right? So John chapter 5, verse Verse 1, here's what it says. It says, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, if you don't know much about the Bible or if you're new to this, Jesus spent the majority of his life in about a hundred mile radius area from Galilee to Jerusalem, Samaria, those sort of areas, walked everywhere he went. So it wasn't unusual for him to go back and forth to Jerusalem. This particular time, when he went up to Jerusalem, one of the Jewish festivals was happening. We don't know which one it was, but a festival was, I, I don't know, think state fair type of thing, but for for religious, uh, for the Jews, it was a big party. It was a lot of things going on, different things they were celebrating. Jesus was walking into a pretty celebratory time in Jerusalem. Verse 2, now they're in Jerusalem. Now they're in Jerusalem near the sheep gate. Let me tell you what a sheep gate is. A sheep gate was the entrance to um, the city where in Jerusalem, the entire city was kind of built around the temple, the place of worship. The sheep gate was where they would bring the sheep that were going to be sacrificed in the temple. So there were multiple gates around the city. This particular gate is where this happens. It says, near the sheep gate, there was a pool, which in Aramaic is called uh, Bethesda. Everybody say, Beth say Bethesda. Cool. All right. Let me give you an interesting fact. This is really cool. Throughout the centuries, people have tried to disprove the Bible. Um, it still happens today. There were several years ago that um, there was a National Geographic uh, scientist who tried to disprove that, uh, that, the, that the Red Sea um, actually parted and Moses parted the Red Sea and he was having a debate with the creation guy and he said it had to be during one of the drought seasons and it really depart the water really didn't part. The, the children of Israel probably just walked across the Red Sea in probably two to three inches of water. Now, in this debate, this scientist was saying there's no way that the water would have parted. Now, what was really cool is the creationist guy that was talking to him, he said, okay, I'm fine that the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea in two or three inches of water. And he said, okay, then the Bible's not true. He said, well, hang on one second. Let me tell you what's really fascinating. The Bible says that the entire Egyptian army drowned when the water came back over. So you either got to tell me that God parted the Red Sea or an entire army drowned in four inches of water. Hmm. People try to disprove the Bible all the time. In this particular case, this story in the book of John, for years and years and years, people were saying, there, there's no pool around Bethesda. We have been uh, ac uh, excavating and architects have been going down through there until about 1956. In 1956, a group of architects were digging around this particular area, around the, the, the old Jerusalem, and what they unpacked were five individual pools with broken colonnades laying down beside them. Huh. Maybe the Bible's true. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Did y'all like that kind of stuff or does that just bore you? Do y'all like that kind of stuff? You can say I like it. Okay, I didn't care. I liked it. So anyway, um, so th this, <laughs> I do care, all right? Uh, this particular pool is where they were. It was surrounded by five covered colonnades. And here it said this. It says, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, uh, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Well, why would they do this? Why, why would they lie by these pools? Well, in Roman culture at the time, it was said that these pools had healing power. Now, here's a little bit more Bible knowledge that I want to help you out with. Do y'all know that Jesus was not from America? Did y'all know that? Anything that you've seen with Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes is not true. He's not from America. Jesus didn't speak English. He didn't walk around going, hey, y'all. That, that's not how Jesus talked. Jesus was, uh, he was from the Middle East. 
He was a Jew. In his time and his day, he would have spoken in Greek or Aramaic. He would have been able to certainly read Hebrew and speak some of that. And by the way, the Greek that he spoke was more Edneville Greek than it was proper Greek, in case you're wondering. So if there was a hey y'all in Greek, that would have been the kind of language Jesus would have spoke. Well, knowing that Jesus was not from America and the way that the Bible was translated over the years as Bible translations have come out, different Bible translations, and they've been able to unpack things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and other older translations of Scripture, and they found certain things like this. If, um, how many of y'all grew up reading the King James Version of the Bible? You grew up reading the King James. All right, there's nothing wrong with it. Don't, I'm not going to bash it. No big deal at all. If you'd like the these and the thous and the those, man, go for it. Read it. It's beautiful. It's poetic. I usually teach and preach out of the NIV. The, the, uh, people call it the nearly inspired translation, all right? It's, it's the new international version is what it is. Um, in the NIV and in a lot of newer translations, you will find that verse 4 is missing from your Bible. Like, what? Somebody took verse 4 out of God's word? What are they doing? Well, what happened was this. As they began to find older and older uh, uh, of the manuscripts of the Bible, they began to realize that verse 4 was not in the oldest manuscripts. But I want to show you what it is because it was kind of a customary thing. So they'll put it up on the screen for me, and maybe this will help some of you Bible geeks like me help out a little bit, all right? So verse 4, the way it is in some translations, it says, and I even put my notes or the notes from my Bible in this, some manuscripts include here holy or in part that they waited for the moving of the waters. So they're around this pool and they waited for the moving of the waters. And then verse 4 in some translations would say, From time to time an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Now the reason that this was removed from translations like the one that we're in is because it's not found in the earliest manuscripts. So it's believed that scribes or ones that were translating the Bible added this as kind of a customary sort of a thought process. Sort of an idea of what people believed at that time. We don't really believe that an angel stirred up waters for people to be able to get healed. I mean, it could have been, I don't know, the earth was burping. I don't have any idea. But people believed, along with Roman culture, that there was healing in these pools. Now, are y'all fully geeked out with the Bible now? Are you? Did you learn something this morning? Yes. Everybody learned something? Yes. All right, God bless you as you go. Now, I, I won't do that to you. I, I want to get to the point of where we are, but I, I felt like I needed to teach you that while we were going. Let me skip down to verse, uh, verse 5 that we have in this translation and many others. Throw that up on the screen for me, if you will. In verse 5, here's where we get to this. And you're going to see the point that I have underlined and in bold. Uh, there was a guy there. There was one who was there who had been invalid uh, for 38 years. It's interesting that the Bible includes a, a fact, the Apostle John who wrote this, who was probably there with Jesus as an eyewitness who saw this, said this man had been an invalid for 38 years. This means that at some point in time he was not an invalid. At some point in time he would have had use of his legs and had the other bodily functions, but for 38 years he was this way. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for quite a long time, 38 years is a long time, he asked him this question, do you want to get well? Now doesn't that seem like the easiest question that Jesus could ever ask you? I mean, my obvious answer would be yes, right? But as I was thinking about this and as I was studying this week and I was just saying, God, there's something to teach in this because why would Jesus ask the question, do you want to get well? And then something occurred to me and I began to dig and I began to look and I began to see different things out of this and I began to think about the fact that maybe this pool is a little bit like church, just a little bit, just a little bit because see, if you come to church, I'm sure you're here. I am absolutely, I mean, the people in first service, they just, they must not be. But the people here in second service, you guys are here because you want your relationship with Jesus to grow. You are here to worship God with other people. You are here to sacrificially give. You are here to accept people where they are and refuse to leave them there. You're here to make a difference in your life. And you walked in saying, Jesus, I need all of you today and I'm going to leave different. And whatever you challenge me with, I'm going to do it. That's why all of y'all are in church this morning, right? It's about the number of amens I expected. See, most of us come to church out of habit. 
So I got to thinking about what's, what's the similarities between church and these people that are coming to the pool. And why would Jesus sit and look at this man and say, do you want to be healed? Well, I believe, I believe this to be true. And, and I don't think I'm stretching this in any way whatsoever. But I believe that some people, some people don't want to be healed. Some people will come to church or come to Jesus and they will say, hey, Jesus, I want to be a Christian, but can I be a Christian on my terms? Can I do it my way? I mean, I know you said don't forsake the assembling of your people together, but you know, Jesus, when you said come to church, you didn't mean every week, did you? I don't want to do that. I mean, there's baseball and lakes and all this other stuff I got to do. Besides that, it's summertime. It's the last day before school starts and I forgot to get the teacher list. So I don't know what I'm going to say. We ain't going to church. It's all right. Um, No, listen, so many people will come to church. They'll be a part of Christianity, but they don't want to be healed. They don't want anything to change in their life. Some people don't want to be healed. Like the people sitting around this pool, I wonder if some people are here uh, because they want the company. Well, I like people. How many of y'all got friends in this church? If you got friends in this church, say, I got friends. How many of y'all, for, mo- for a lot of you, how many of you, the only time you see the people that are your friends at church is on Sundays? Does that happen with a lot of y'all? There's a lot of y'all only see on Sundays. There's a lot of y'all, I don't know what your name is, but I introduce myself to you every week. And it's all good. And by now, you should remind me what your name is before I ask, right? But a lot of us, we come to church and we see our friends. See, a lot of people don't want to be healed. A lot of people don't want to change. A lot of people don't want so much of Jesus that something in their life has to change. They don't want to heal from it. They don't want to heal from whatever's holding them back. They don't want to heal from the thing that has removed them or separated them from God. Whatever brokenness is in their life, whether it's of their, their own decisions or of somebody else's decisions, people that have gone through abuse and abandonment and divorce and alcoholism and drugs and everything else, or maybe lust or whatever it may be, the things that are driving you away, you don't want to get healed. The only reason you're at church, the only reason you would be in a place like that pool is because you just want company. Company. The second thing that people would get around this pool for, maybe they just wanted company, maybe they just wanted sympathy. I know it's not people in the second service, and don't you tell the people in first service that I was talking about them, okay? I know it's nobody here. But there are some people (laughs) who all they want to be known for is the brokenness in their life. Now now hear me correctly. If, If you're following Jesus, there's some brokenness. There ought to be part of your story that is part of brokenness. But at what point does that take over you and it becomes pride? And it becomes something that all you really want is sympathy. All you really want is for somebody to come by and go, oh man, you know their story. They're just pitiful. They're just horrible. You know, they're that. And, and some people just come for that. I just need people to gather around me. I just need people around me to just sit in my mess with me. We, we just need to open a can of beans and I'll eat them together. Nobody loves me yet. But anyway, I won't do that, all right? Some people, they only want the company. Some people only want the sympathy. And then some people only want charity. They only want people to feel sorry for them and to help them out. That's the guys that were gathered around the pool, the people that were gathered around here. And I wonder if maybe that's why people come to church sometimes. But listen, Jesus walks into the scene and he says this to the man. He says, do you want to be healed. He doesn't tell the man what he's going to do. He doesn't tell the man how this is going to happen. He asks him a very simple question. Do you want to be healed? So if this morning you are somebody who has something in your life that is hindering you from Jesus, that is holding you back, and you keep saying, I'm just going to go to church because that way everybody knows who I am. Everybody knows my trouble. Everybody might step out and help me, but you don't want to change. I'm telling you this morning with the power of Jesus over everything that's being said, Because it's his word. If you want to be healed, Jesus can heal you. But the want to has to precede the how to. Because Jesus is going to do what Jesus is going to do with you or without you. But the question is sitting there. Do you want? Do you want to be healed? Or do you want to sit And the woe is me's. See, the want to always, always, always has to precede the how to. Not everybody that comes to church wants to be healed. They, 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 want, they want all the how-tos. Pastor, you're telling me if I just read my Bible every day, everything in my life will be better. Well, it, it's part of it. My question is this. Are you willing to give up whatever it is in your life that's between you and God? Do you want to be healed? See, the want to always precedes it. I think about the want-tos with the how-tos. 
Um, several months ago, my wife and I got on a journey of getting healthier and we began to, to exercise more and eat healthier and everything else. And we're on a journey. It's gonna, we're just part of it. We're just trying to be healthier. I don't have no major huge goals in mind. Just want to be healthier. So we're working on this. So I got to thinking about this when I was studying. The want to has to precede the how to. So for me, if somebody walked in the back door of the church this morning and they said, Tony, I hear you're on a health journey. I guarantee you that I can get you healthy. And all it's going to take is 30 days and all you have to do is eat this one thing for 30 days and you can get healthy I would stand here and go well that's intriguing that sounds like a 2 a.m. infomercial on tv when I've stayed up too late and if that dude stepped up and he said this is all you have to do Tony all you have to do is eat brussels sprouts three times a day for 30 days and you'll feel better you can eat them broiled, you can eat them, you can eat them uh, basted, you can eat them fried, you can eat Brussels sprouts however you want to. My want to will not allow me to get to the how to. Because I am not eating Brussels sprouts. I have made, some of y'all are going, you just haven't had them cooked right. Yeah, you're exactly right. The only recipe I like is when you put them on a pan with a bunch of olive oil because they slide right in the garbage perfectly right after you do that. Brussels sprouts are created in the pit of hell and Satan releases them onto the earth. So somebody stepped out and they said, Pastor, you can be completely healthy. All you got to do is eat Brussels sprouts. I ain't got to want to. It's all right. I'll die. It'll be fine. (laughs) See, the want to always precedes the how to. It's always the case. So when Jesus comes to you and he says, do you want to sit in that pain? Do you want to sit in that hurt? Do you want to continue to sit in the lies that the enemy is constantly telling you? Is that where you want to be? Then if that's where you want to be, okay. Now this is pretty interesting because if Jesus came to me and he said, do you want to be healed? I I would probably be looking for the answer of Jesus. Sure, I I want to be healed. But look at what the man does. I mean, the answer is awkward. It it seems like it should be a yes or no question, but look what the man responds with in verse 7. He says this. He says, sir, the man, the invalid replied, he said, I I have no one to help me. I, I don't think Jesus was looking for his excuses, do you? I don't think Jesus was looking for him to give a full explanation. This would be like standing before an attorney. An attorney said, sir, this is a yes or no answer. I don't need all the dialogue with it. Just as yes or no, do you want to be healed? The man didn't respond that way. He said, sir, I don't have anyone to help me into the pool when the water stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else gets ahead of me. I, listen, I, I can't get into the mind of Jesus and what he was thinking in that moment. But there's a reason he was Jesus and I'm not. Because I'd be sitting there going, what? What? I didn't ask you any of that. I asked you a question. Do you want to be healed? A lot of us sit right here. A lot of us will say, I want to follow Jesus. And when Jesus says, are you ready? Are you ready to take the step? Are you ready to be healed? Are you ready to quit blaming things in your past? Are you ready to quit saying, well, I was born this way? Are you ready to quit saying, well, it's because of this event. That's why I do this. It's because of abuse. It's because of abandonment. It's because of divorce. It's because of whatever, a thousand things. And please don't hear me not being uh, um, just saddened and compassionate toward whatever you've gone through. But at some point in time, Jesus is... He's, here today. Listen, I brought the Holy Spirit with me, so I know he's here. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is standing in front of you today, not in me, but yes, in me, but not me, the Holy Spirit, but saying to you, do you want to be healed? And if you're sitting there saying, well, I, I, I mean, I, I do, but I, I mean, I, I can't ever. What, uh, 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 uh. See, here's a crazy thing. Let me, let me give you a statement. And if you're following along in notes online, if you happen to be on there, let me give you a statement right here. Jesus wants your story to be a redemptive story, not a pitiful story. You can spend your entire life giving an excuse why you've told Jesus, well, well. Or you can say to Jesus, yeah, I want to get healed. Now, the story takes a, uh, takes a little odd turn. And again, God's going to do what God's going to do, whether I want to participate or not, because God's God and I'm not. Um, So Jesus is going to heal him anyway. See, sometimes um, Jesus has faith for us. (laughs) 
Sometimes Jesus says, I'll take care of the faith part. I'm going to do this because I've got a plan. In verse 8, Jesus said to him, said to the man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. Now, there's multiple kinds of miracles in the New Testament that Jesus performed. There's some people that he healed instantly. There's some people, there's one particular guy that he spit on mud and wiped it in his eyes. That's weird. But Jesus can do whatever Jesus wants to do. There's other people that they began to see and a little bit kind of hesitate, and it sort of came. This particular miracle happened immediately. The man got up, picked up his mat, and he began to walk. Let me give you another statement. This is kind of cool. It hit me, and it may not excite you the way it excited me, but I actually was in my office or in, in studying the other day, and when this hit me and this thought crossed my mind, I went, woo. <laughs> That's what I did. Just really loud like this. Woo! L- look at this statement, all right? It may not mean anything to you, but it did to me. The thing that once carried him, he now carried. <laughs> See, the thing is, Jesus wants to use the thing you need to be healed from. Jesus wants to use your story. The thing that's holding you back. The thing that you keep making an excuse for. The thing that you keep saying, well, I'm just coming to church to be around people, to get sympathy, to get charity, but I don't really want to be healed. That very thing. Jesus is looking at you this morning and he's saying to you, that thing that is carrying you, I want you to pick it up and carry it out with you and use it for my glory, not for yours. What are you going to do with it? See, here's my question. Do you want to get healed? Do you want to get healed? Now the story takes a turn right here and we actually find out this is just yet another trap that the religious rulers are trying to use to trap Jesus. And it says that um, in verse 9, the the end of verse 9, it's recorded this way from John. He says, the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. Now listen, they could not stand for Jesus to do things against the Jewish law. They didn't realize that the Jewish law in its completion was standing in front of them. So they kept getting mad. The day that it took place was a Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders, in all their glory, said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat on the Sabbath. Now again, you'll have to just kind of pardon me for just a second because I put myself into that story for just a minute and realized that if I was the man who had been invalid for 38 years and this guy who I didn't know who he was came along and said, do you want to be healed? And he healed me even though I gave him an excuse and he told me to pick up my mat and to walk with it and then a bunch of religious Pharisees and and people that wanted to tell me how to live and what to do things stood in front of me and said, you're not supposed to carry your mat on the Sabbath day. You know what I would have done? There would have been a brawl right there at the colonnade. Are you kidding? I don't even know what day of the week it is. I just know I hadn't walked in 38 years, so get out my face, all right? That's that's what I'd have done. There's something in this guy, though. I I don't know what the deal is. I really don't. I wish that, like, there was another chapter in the Bible that told us the rest of this guy's story. We don't know his name. We don't know what happened after this incident. There's something odd here for me, though. Go go to the next verse for me in verse 11. It says this, but the man replied, "Uh, the man who made me well said to me, pick up my mat and walk. So they asked him, who's this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? But he replied, or the man who was healed had no idea who it was. He didn't know who it was. The man who was healed had no idea, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. So it seems to me After being an invalid for 38 years, when Jesus came and said, you're now healed, and somebody says to me, you need to put your mat down because you're not supposed to carry it on the Sabbath day, that that would have been fighting words. Instead, this guy said, well, I don't know who he was. I don't don't know where he went. I I don't know what's happening. The story doesn't end there. The encounter with Jesus wasn't finished in verse 14. Uh, John records this. He says, later, later Jesus found him at the temple. Of course, he was at the sheep gate, which allowed the sheep into the temple. So, and if he was Jewish, he ultimately would have had to present himself to the priest since he would have been healed. But Jesus found him at the temple. And he said to him, see, you're well again. Do you want to be well? See, you're well again. And then Jesus says something very interesting. He says this to the man. He says, stop sinning 
or something worse may happen to you. There's a lot in that statement, and, and I need you to hear this very, very correctly. Not every affliction, not every difficulty, not everything in your life is because you did something wrong. There are a lot of people that are in this church, and I know a lot of you personally, and I've heard your stories. A lot of you didn't ask to be abused, didn't ask to be raped, didn't ask to be in the circumstances you were in, didn't ask to be in those places. You didn't ask to have to live without that person that you loved. You didn't ask to be in those places, and you didn't do anything to cause it. But in this particular story, in this particular man, Jesus said, something, something you had done was the reason you were here. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're sitting here and if, if Jesus were standing here and he said to you, do you want to be healed? You don't feel like you can be healed because you know you're the one that got you in the difficult circumstances that you see your life in. Jesus is saying, step away from it. Step away from it. I still don't know if this man got it. I I wish we had the rest of the story. Verse 15, it says, the man went away, told the Jewish leaders, "Eh, it was Jesus who made him well. I, I don't know. But it ultimately comes down to this one question that Jesus is asking. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? If you want to be healed, Jesus can heal you. And uh, you can walk out of here today carrying the thing that you carried in here. So let me ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready to carry the thing that once carried you? Are you ready? Do you want to get well? There's some things in your life today that Jesus is saying, and he's asking you, do you want to be healed? All he wants you to do is just say yes. He he wants to take the brokenness and the unhealed parts of your life, the unforgiveness that some of you have been carrying and holding on, and it's just wearing you out. Do you want to be healed? There's families today that need to be healed. Some of you are sitting in here and you are so bitter against another family member and and Jesus is saying to you, do you want to be healed? Some of your relationships are sitting in places where all you got to do is bring that to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to be healed. And then the how-to can follow the want-to. There's friendships that are falling apart. They need to be healed. Jesus is asking you, are you going to stay in the sickness? Are you going to stay where you are? Or do you want to be healed? And see, ultimately, one day, every single one of us is going to stand before God. I I don't know when your life's going to end. I'm I'm not predicting anybody, and I'm not hoping bad on anybody. But I know this, life doesn't last forever. I've lost some people that I care for dearly. Family members and some of the closest friends have died when I didn't think they were supposed to die. Because I don't get to predict that. And I don't know when, and I don't know how. But I do know this. I do know that one day, every single one of you, if I could make eye contact with every one of you, I would look you in the eyes and I would tell each and every one of you, one day you're going to stand before God. And God's going to look at you and he's going to say, what'd you do with Jesus? What'd you do? Did you want to be healed or not? The answer you give today will be the result of what happens for eternity because the Bible is very, very clear and I believe this is God's word. And listen, I believe there's people that are here, maybe that's you this morning, you're going, well, I can believe in whatever God I want to believe in. You have the right to believe in whatever you want to believe in. You also have the right to be wrong. And one day, you're going to stand before God. And when you stand before him, if you didn't do anything with Jesus, there's going to be separation. The Bible describes a place called hell. We don't talk about it a lot anymore because we don't want to offend people. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says about about hell. It's eternal separation from God. It's It's a lake of fire for all of eternity. You don't just enter and get burned up and you're done. The Bible says it's a place of darkness. It's a place of sulfur. It's a place where the worm doesn't die. It's a place of complete, total separation from God with pain and agony for all of eternity. Whatever the worst pain you could possibly think of, that's the rest of eternity. Oh, 
Pastor, that was offensive. Well, I didn't say it. Jesus did. You can blame him. And yet he's standing here today and he's saying to you, if you don't know, if you don't know Jesus today, you know what he's saying to you? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Because the biggest disease in the entire world is the disease of not coming to Jesus. That's, it. That's the one. Oh, I can make it through this earth with plantar fasciitis and tendonitis and arthritis and all the other itises. I can make it. I, I can do it. It's going to be painful, but I can do it. What I can't do is enter into eternity without Jesus. Maybe today he's saying to you, do you want to be healed? It's time to make that decision. It's time. It, it's, it's not a difficult thing. Oh, it cost Jesus his life. He had to lay his life down for us. But for us, it's, it's this. It's believing that Jesus is God's son. It's repenting of our sin and knowing that we are sinners. And without Jesus, there is nothing we can do. But we accept his love. We accept his forgiveness. We ask him to be part of our lives and we turn our lives. We repent and we turn toward him. That's what it means to be healed and start your relationship with Jesus. Some of you need to do that today. Some of you, oh man, this hurts. Some of you have been coming to church for a long time. And you're sitting here today and you have every excuse. And every single time, me or Kyle or PV or Heath or when Crystal's up here teaching with Kyle, anytime God's word is open, every single time it's open, you're sitting out there and you have an opportunity to say to Jesus, I'm ready to take my next step. I'm ready to go forward. And every single time it comes out, you find an excuse. You just want the company of church. You just want the sympathy of people knowing that you're hurting and you're just here so somebody will give you something. Jesus is saying today to you, do you want to be healed? And if I can paint the picture well for you, if you say, no, I don't want to get healed, then you're going to take your mat, you're going to lay on it, and you're going to crawl right out of the church one more time. You might come back next week, you might not, because I might have ticked you off today. Do you want to be healed? Here's a compassionate, loving Jesus asking you, do you want to be healed? So, will you do me a favor? Everybody just close your eyes for a second. We don't, we don't do this very often, but I'm going to do it today. Just close your eyes. Whether it is you making a decision of saying, I, I want to be healed of sin. I want to give my life to Jesus today. If, if that's you this morning, I, I'm, I'm just going to do this, all right? If that's you this morning, you say, I need to start a relationship with Jesus. I need to be healed of that sin, and I need to give my life to Jesus today and begin a relationship with him. And I want to do that today. If that is you, will you put your hand up? so that I can pray for you. Just put your hand up real high. Put your hand up. Let me see you. I want to start a relationship with Jesus today. That's what I need to do. There you go. All right. Now let me ask this. And be honest. Nobody's looking around but me right now. Be honest. You would say this morning, there's something in my life that I need Jesus to heal me from. It's been holding me back. It's been part of my story that I've been holding on to that I haven't surrendered to him. It's something in my life either I did or something was done against me, but it's been my excuse way too long. And it's time for me to say, yes, Jesus, I want to be healed. If that's you this morning, will you put your hand up so I can pray for you? There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. You can put them back down. Anybody else? Just put them up so I can see you and pray for you. I'm not going to call your name. Just put them up. Anybody else? I want to be healed this morning. You can put them down. Thank you. Listen, I'm not going to run. You keep your eyes closed. I'm not going to run around the building slapping you on the forehead and pushing electricity through you and handing you handkerchiefs. That's not my job. What I am going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer of healing for you. See, healing can really happen. It happens through prayer. So I'm going to pray a prayer of healing for you, and here's the prayer. Everybody's got their eyes closed. Here's what I'm praying. Jesus, today... There are some that said they need to start a journey with you. They need to start a relationship with you. And that's what they need to be healed from. And there are others, God, multiples that have said, I've been holding on to this long enough, Jesus. There's been many opportunities for me to say, yes, I want to be healed and I haven't. So today I'm saying it. God, I, I pray that they, they take the want to and then let the how to follow. God, let them today as they walk out, take that first step of carrying out what once carried them. 
and let things in their lives change. God, we've all got steps we need to take. We've all got things we need to do. May we be a church that provides these steps. God, I pray that everyone that raised their hand today that wants to take that next step will talk to someone, someone in their small group, someone in their community, someone at the the new here desk, me, Kyle, someone that's here and just say, hey, tell me what I need to do. I want to be healed and now I need to take the steps. God, may we offer that. May we show you through everything we do. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.